I have 18 inches stand up and cut it. And it goes just really. You'd have to climb down the ladder, turn sideways to go up the ladder to do the other. That's all. Yeah, that's what I thought. We are not at the great two seven two fifty seven. Everything silent, everything silent. So, I don't. I got her. She's so happy. You know, she's packed a lot. Uh, her eyesight is so bad that this one area was dark. Yeah. And even with the lights on, never got the light enough on this tiny little She's very happy, and that's all that matters. My brother's happy. She's happy. And Good. How should we expect? Okay. Amazon, I don't know. Amazon's weird. Yeah. Put a cricket. Being that for a politics. Cricket the size of a box. Okay. Folks, if you could all make sure that you are on mute until the mayor calls for comment, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Pete the dog, Transom. You don't, you don't pay it to me. Confiscate the dog. Well, it's that's cool. I like the dog. I like the dog. I can be the dog. I can be the vet dog. Hey, praying mantis, could you please mute? So my drink old man will beat your ass. Yeah, beat your ass.
Caller, could you please mute your phone for us? Thank you. Chad, are you there? Reggie, I mean, there's some in the back of you can put your hand in. I mean, if you really look at all the cracks in this block, it's it's not safe. <laughs> that's just my opinion. <laughs> so to introduce you, that that's Mark McFadden, our public works director. Uh, he has the shop that's out behind, and the uh, 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 the pole barn where the tractors are stored. Uh, as well, and, and that's something in the future we're going to have to talk to as well. But Mark's been here, what, seven? How many years, Mark? 25. 20 years. So he's been around this building for quite a bit of time. <laughs> well, I want to introduce you. Do you mind if I add on a little bit? Are you first, then? Of course. Do you mind if I add on? Um, I'm Dana Gould. Um, if you don't know me, I am, I guess, by our standard, by Gearheart standards, I'm fairly new to town. I've been here since 2018, so I am definitely a newbie, but I've been on city council now. Y'all voted me in, whether you know it or not, you voted me in last November. Um, and prior to that, I was appointed. Um, I think probably a lot of the reason why I was elected um, was because I have a past background in um, building public buildings. And to answer your question, what we're doing right now is we're, we're in the process of a preliminary needs assessment. So whenever you have a problem like this, you always look at it from the beginning. You don't, you don't run around with the picture frame and try and find a picture to fit into it. You start with what is the problem, and then you determine what are the solutions? How am I going to solve this? Um, so we have been working on a, on a needs assessment. It's preliminary right now. Some of the information that I have learned 
um, in my exploration and pa uh, my past experience, just so you know, I did 30 years in law enforcement, um, did a variety of work in law enforcement, but my very last command, I was in command of a jail facility that also had a fire facility. Um, I had an inmate fire crew that worked for me. So I don't know what they know, and I don't even pretend to know what they know, but I, I know I have enough of knowledge to, to start to ask the questions, what is it that you need? Um, just like some of you are, are wanting to know what do we what do we need? So some of the these are this is not an inclusive list. This is a preliminary list, but some of the basic things that you can see right off the bat when you walk up to this building is that um, all of our equipment that has now been pushed out, when it is in here, it fills up this building. Um, it's very difficult to maneuver around. Um, it's not what you would see on Chicago Fire, where it seems like they have a lot of room to for activities in there. Um, when that equipment is in here, it's full. And the interesting thing about that is that that equipment is not full size equipment. That equipment is custom ordered to fit into our building because our building was built in 1958 to the standards then. And as you can imagine, as other things have changed since 1958, so have the standards. And our, our city has grown and we could use different equipment, but we're limited on the type of equipment that we can get based on the size of this building. Not a problem, we can continue to order that size equipment. That's an operational way, way to, when you look at a problem, you say, can I solve this operationally? Or am I going to solve it through, do I actually have to change the physical plant structure? And that's something that we can continue to maybe adjust for and change, uh, make operational changes to some extent. But we also have to remember that this building has been serving us since 1958. And we'd like it to service, I mean, we'd like to hand off something to the people that inherit this town from us that lasts at least the next 20 years or the length of whatever bond we end up having to get. I think we can all agree on that, whether we can agree on where it's going to be. We don't want to be short-sighted. We want it to be something that, that others can use. So looking into the future, will we always be able to make that operational change and, and modify our equipment to fit in here? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but that would be just one of the problems. Um, so you start in the beginning of the building, and the reason I bring to your attention the, the length of the equipment here, look at the apron. The apron is the driveway in front. Is that a standard apron? What needs do we have as far as that apron? Um, drainage is a, is a big one for watering. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he brings up a good, a good point. Um, in my past experience with building projects, um, when you start talking about drainage, and anytime you make a modification to a public building, a lot of different organizations start to look at you and what you're doing and you have to bring it up to current standards. And um, sometimes it's very easy to modify an old building like this and sometimes it's not. I mean, you could look around and say, well, maybe we just repoint the brick and then just keep with this building. Um, maybe, maybe not. There are some other regulations that we'll get to in, in, in a little bit. And as we go through this process, we'll, we'll explore those together. But um, one of the one of the problems getting back to the drainage issue is that one of the agencies that will look at us and expect us to bring our, our operation up to modern standards is EPA. And the EPA, for some funny reason, doesn't like it when you just wash your vehicles and let the, the stuff just drain down into any kind of a place. So yes, you would need to have some kind of capture system to capture the things that are coming off of the fire trucks. Because as you can imagine, when they're out there next to car fires and accidents where carcinogens are being released as they are when there's a, a car accident um, and that stuff is getting on the, on the truck, for some funny reason, the EPA doesn't like it when you just wash it into the ground. So we would have to, we have to create a capture system. So that's gonna eat up some of our real estate. So um, what about the locker rooms? Are your locker rooms sufficient? What do you think? Lo locker room. New division yeah. chief? Yeah. yeah, what do you think? Can I actually speak on that? Yeah. So um, there is no locker rooms here. Um, we have one bathroom that I share with a whole bunch of guys. Um, I'm okay with that, but I don't think that is very inclusive to the generation of firefighters that we're seeing nowadays. Um, we need to be able to entice the volunteers. There's so many out there. There's so many people that want to do this, but we need to make sure that we're inclusive to um, all genders, all races, all those things. And having one bathroom and zero locker rooms does not um, help in that situation. Yeah. Um, and piggybacking on that, we don't forget that we're not talking about just the fire station, right? We're also talking about law enforcement. Um, and I'm gonna let the chief hit on anything I miss, but 
I can see one great big glaring obvious problem with not having a locker room for our law enforcement. They don't have a locker room either. So he is our, are you our only officer on ball, on duty right now? Yes, I am. Okay, so you're the one guy. How, how many minutes does it take you to drive home? Uh, to my house, a good day is 15 minutes. Okay, so 15 minutes. So if you were to be out on a scene of something and you were to get a bloodborne pathogen like blood, or let's say you had to use pepper spray, OC for, for the um, those of you, and you had to change your clothes, how, how far do you have to drive round trip? Uh, 30 minutes and then it does it just depends on what I'm actually bringing into my house so I don't really want to bring bloodborne pathogens into my home so that causes another issue as well kind of fends your wife yeah a little bit she doesn't like it too much <laughs> and, and you know that's that's the whole thing too there's no word for us to I mean I, I've had a lot of stuff thrown at me and had things put on me that were undesirable and stuff that you don't want to take to your home you need somewhere that's provided to you uh as an employee to be able to clean yourself up. And also storage. Your yes. go, what do you call it? A go bag, a ditty bag? We used to call it a war bag. Yeah, war bag. The, the yeah. various accoutrement that you might need while you're- the backup of everything. Right, but not something you would necessarily want to leave out where anybody could pick it up and, and walk off with right. it. Right. Um, did I miss anything else? Okay. Um, so along with locker rooms, it's it's not only just the locker rooms. We do have a lovely bathroom. I encourage you all to take a look in there when you and in, in, in try and fit a couple people in there as you walk around the building. But um, remember, we have one bathroom here and we have two bathrooms over on in City Hall service to all of our emergency responders. Um, the problem I see from this is is aside from the fact that um, that's a lot of people that might need to go to the bathroom before they get sent out on the next call and the longer the line is the longer it's going to take them to get you know through the line and get back out on the next call um if for, for example the chief were to bring somebody in um a detainee that he needed to interview he th there's no separate bathroom in a secure location to take him where if you are out in you know in the meeting rooms with us or any place else there's no protection and that is that is a, I mean, I can understand why they didn't do that in, in Gearhart back in 19, I think 72 was when they first built this building and, and the police station was built sometime after that, but it's probably been at least 40 years. Um, I could see why they weren't thinking along those lines, but now more and more with the calls for service that we're getting, um, I, I mean, I've, I've seen the social media posts that people are concerned about um, guys acting up in front of the liquor store and, and acting. That kind of guy you don't want to just bring into the middle of city hall and and let him just use an, uh, bathrooms or be in an unsecured location. Modern industry standards in law enforcement, you know, are are generally that you have some kind of a secure place to to keep those kind of people separated away for the protection of the public. If I make sure that, just to piggyback on that, if I make a, a custody arrest and I have to come back to the police department to get paperwork, do a uh, uh, an affidavit or anything that I need to take with me to the jail. I can't leave that that uh, detainee, that arrestee in my vehicle uh, because no one's got eyes on them. So I'm left with a dilemma uh, because if I leave them in the car, they could, for instance, bash their head into the, the window or something like that, uh, which is not uncommon. And, and I'm kind of stuck for what I, what, what I can do. And so having somewhere to, to place a detainee in, even if it's an interview room slash with a with a bench on it that has a, a hook to cuff them to, there's nothing there. Uh, so it does make it very challenging for us. Very challenging. Um, okay, so getting back to this building here, do you have anything else? I'm sorry. Oh. Getting back to this building here, some things that I observed, um, climate control. Um, right now it's, it's kind of toasty because we're all in here, um, but it's not always the case in here. And um, these doors back here, do you want to talk about the problems with the doors? Um, I can, or you can say how easy they're to lift up or <laughs> pull in. I would like to show you all my size. I'm very strong for my size, but um, I was on zero feet pulling down 21 store yesterday, trying to get it off the door. These are manually opening doors. Um, it adds time to our response. We have to open them and we have to close them to secure our building before we leave. So say you're having a medical emergency and you want me out the door as soon as possible. Now I have to manually open your door. I have to pull the apparatus out. I have to let it air out before I can shut the door because now I just have exhaust fumes in here 
and then I have to manually close the door. That adds at least two minutes to our response time. Okay, not only does that have to do with us responding to your emergency, those are ISO ratings for your insurance as well. So just things to consider on that. And we looked, and, and these doors also, they leak, right? It's not unusual to have puddles of yeah. water. Mm -hmm. We're lucky there wasn't a rainstorm this morning. I don't know where feet would be wet. Okay. Are we even, we're missing some panels the too, window right? in the far back. And how much did it, how much was the estimate back then to replace them? Um, what was it? Four years ago, we were given an estimate from three different places, ranging from fifty to $70,000, just for these four doors. Right. So we have to consider, I mean, you, we, we go through the same process or we all need to go through the same process you would if you if your roof was not in repair. You would look at it and say, okay, is it worth patching or is it worth just going ahead and taking off the entire roof and replacing? So that's part of the process we now are faced with and that we're going to need your help and advice on. Um, so, and also city city hall, the, or at least the police station, the doors over there, um, I know the doors over there in City Hall are a sore subject with many people, but I can tell you I am not even happy with this with the doors that we have on the police station. There's there's no what type of items do you have to secure back there? Oh, I've got anything from someone's money to firearms to pers very com very very confidential information uh, from lots of people that if someone were to desire to get it, they could. I mean it's. It's not very secure. Would you like better storage for the firearms and better security for the firearms you have to take? I need an armory. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I, let's just be honest. I mean, I need somewhere that's secure, that's that's to the standard to keep things out of people's hands that aren't supposed to touch it. It's pretty basic stuff. I mean, it's something's got to be there in order for me to secure things that, that don't want to grab. Yeah. It's not there. And, and the other thing is that that's a modern industry standard is to have an armory, not only for that reason, but you also have to remember that um, if we have a problem here in our area, we have great IGAs and IGAs and it is an agreement with other agencies that they will come help us, we will go help them, which means even though we, you might look at our, at their list of calls and the things that they report each month, the cranny, we think, well, Gearhart's a really pretty safe place. You can't rule out the fact that these folks will be involved in things in other, in other areas around us. And if you look at Seaside, what do we have there? We have a school, we have the convention center, we have a lot of tourists, we have a lot of things that could, um, that make could present a threat that you would want to be prepared for. And um, I mean, gone are the days where you expected your law enforcement to run around with their extra bullets in their pockets, right? And yet you don't want them to have them in their car where somebody could steal them. You want a secure armory to, to store the stuff that would be unsafe if it got out into the public, and yet they still might need um, and would not want to be caught without in case an emergency arose. Um, go ahead. So yeah. Talk about that. Oh, yeah. So um, I'll give me a minute to to do the uh, get to the evidence. I don't want to forget anything. Um, oh, so we were talking about exhaust. So this building has a lot of exhaust. What does this system right here do? It's it's our cascade system that filters air to be Okay, so in plain English, so everybody understands. Yeah. Yeah. That. Chad's gonna pick one up and show everyone. We have a couple of things that never change. Super lightweight. Yeah, awesome. really yeah. comfortable. So that's what we use to breathe inside a fire or house fire, car fire, what they call ideolate, eminent danger, life and health. Any environment that's not like this, we can all breathe fine right here. But any environment we go to that cannot breathe normal air, we put one over. And what, are, what does OSHA say about filling it up from the air in here where you have exhaust fumes? We have to wait um, 45 minutes for it to clear out if anything has started pulled out or back in. So if you want to have a house fire, you have to schedule it. And we're going to have a 45 minute lapse in between, right? Yeah, if we have any trainings or any, anything in between or uh, another fire went to to change up bottles or what have you. Yeah, we talked about, op I, I mentioned operational changes and physical changes that we can do. Operationally, they've, they've come up with a workaround that's going to work short term. The operational change that they've done is they've done, a, it's, they're calling it a snorkel. So they are now pulling air from outside to fill up. Is that working for you all? Um, that is in process. It's in process. Okay, so they're going to do that and they're hoping to do that. But what you've been told is that that will shorten the lifespan of this very expensive yeah. piece of equipment if we do that. Okay, yeah. so we have to do it in order to keep our law enforcement or our fire off, uh, firemen, fire ladies, firefighters safe. 
but yet we know that in the end it's going to probably cost us more because the system is not going to last as long and osha is really not not thrilled with that kind of with those kind of workarounds but we're, we're going to do it because we have to do it um meeting and training rooms um this was another hot tick I item or um, item of discussion uh, in the past, people want to know why do you have to have a training room? Why do you have to have this and that and the other? Um, and I would say that I agree in some, to some extent with some of the arguments that were made that maybe there was some redundancy in the plans that were you know in the past that we're not gonna talk about anymore because they're in the past, but looking to the future, um, do we still need a training room? Yes. And can that training room also be our emergency operations center and our, and our meeting hall and all of those things? Yes, it can. Why do we need that? Because we're in Little Gearheart and we don't really anticipate anything happening here. Well, um, I, I was in law enforcement in Southern California. I have been on, I was on duty during the LA riots. I have been on duty during two terrorist attacks. I have been on duty during um, multiple wildfires that in, in cases where we had to evacuate entire cities. It's not unusual for you to go and set up a command post and think that you have picked, I mean, you always, we're not stupid. We do scout out the best place to put that command post. And we're pretty sure when we put that command post down or set up our emergency operations center that it's gonna be in the best place. And then the fire has mine of its own. And it changes our mind because it starts coming at us and now we have to move. Or the entire, um, the central central point of whatever it is that you're dealing with, whether it was in our terrorist attack, um, the central location where we needed to operate from moved a couple of times. And that is also a case where sometimes you get in and you find out that there's other reasons why you can't stay there. Like, for example, you might have set up on a natural gas line and that's not your, your best place, or maybe, um, if you're dealing with a terrorist attack, you're dealing with um, secondary devices that are there to target you, the law enforcement or the first responders, and you have to move. There are a number of reasons why you might have to. Mother Nature might have its own ideas about whether this building will, you know, will stand, and maybe that building will stand, will not stand. So you always have to have a lot of options in a, in a county like this where we all work together to create a command post and maybe you even need more because I tell you what, if we have a problem here and I know everybody thinks about tsunamis, but a tsunami is not even in my mind. I mean, yeah, we need to prepare for tsunami, but we also need to prepare for fires. We need to prepare for a lot of the other things that are occurring across Oregon right now. And when you call for help, what happens is people come, they will come. They're gonna come across the 26, they're gonna come up across the 30. And I guarantee you when they come to help, they're not going to plan to head. They're not going to bring a change of underwear and snacks with them. So you have to prepare. You have to have a location where you can sustain those people. Otherwise, they just have to go home and they're not, they're not going to be helpful to you. So you do need a training center, emergency operations center. And I'm not saying it has to be huge, but I am saying that that's going to be something that I will expect and, and insist on on whatever plan, because it, I think in my, in my opinion, it would be just bad planning on our part if we if we forgot if we didn't do that just to save a little bit of money now because certainly i can i can imagine scenarios in the next 20 years where we'll need it okay then you go ahead didn't you have well i could add two comments to that yeah. there, there's two times a year without counting natural disasters or events that we already do that um for the lines of the coast that we set up in the oc here just because of the impact locally that we have to prepare for and we can't have everybody at home where they are and we use that's what our nice little desk here is in the miniature you see that it's supposed to up there. So we do already do that without emergencies happening because on those days that are going to happen, the impacts are too great. Um, He's got a question yeah. for you. Question or comment? Okay, my, my name is Preston Devereaux. I'm an ex-firefighter, ex-chief here at Your Heart. I don't want to pour cold water on anybody, okay? But... This building here was built in 58. It's a non-reinforced CMU building, okay? Construction block. Um, this building definitely needs to be replaced. The question is, where are we going to put it? And how big is it going to be? Now, most of you folk, and I don't want to get into the last fire bond, but most of you folk, 
figured that the location was not ideal. The cost was too much. Okay. We can rebuild the fire station right here. In the next 20 years, I can guarantee you that volunteerism in the fire service is going to be almost non-existent. The land values in Gearheart discourage people that are of the age that would like to volunteer from being able to live in the community. Right? So this is going to be some sort of a substation because eventually what's going to have to happen is that Gearheart and Seaside are going to have to merge together as far as their fire departments go. And you have to have a substation within five miles of the main station in order to keep your ISO rating. So okay. this thing here, where do you get your where do you get your your intake air? Right now? Yeah. From right the blue lid is a screen has all the holes in it. Does it go outside? Not yet. No. So we're in the process of snorkeling it. Why isn't it when you guys put this in? Why didn't you put a, a, a filtered air vent in? That's there? a great question. I've been there for a few years. That was before me. All right. How long has it been? I mean, that you guys have been working on this. We have been. You don't have to. You know. I mean, the trucks. The trucks are starting up in here. Okay, and moving on out there, and then somebody coming in here to fill the bottles. Right. If if you're taking the intake air from here, that's on you. Okay. okay. I mean, I would I would blast a hole in this wall right here and put your put your intake air out there. Every single SCBA, every scuba shop, every everybody that fills bottles has got an air intake outside for clean, fresh air. I I agree with you guys. You know that you need locker space. I agree with you that you need more more restroom facilities. Okay, I I I agree with the police department with the police about having a, having lockers and holding facilities. Right, right now a short term solution. They got these great big huge safes up there at, at uh, Tractor Supply. Huge, seventy two gun. Where am I going to put it, though, to be fair? Because I've got a very, very small limit. I know, I know what size your office is. Yeah, and, and you got to remember, too, when you walk into the police department, there's a reason why you, you really can't see anything, and that's because of criminal justice information systems. I can't have anything in view of the public eye. I can't have computers. I can't have evidence. I can't have anything where anyone that's not properly cleared can see it. So that really limits me to our tiny, small office that three officers share desks in. And that's that even more limits us. Now, great, I'm with you there. We could make workarounds and we could tear, tear some stuff out and remodel them. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking about putting it behind the, your desk. You know, I mean, as far as, as far as, you know, temporary security or something like that. Right. You know, you could, you could bolt it through the concrete floor. And, and I agree. I, those big sites are great, yeah. 100%. You know, but I we mean, also don't have anywhere to put other evidence and there, records. And stuff there like are that. solutions, you know, until we can, you know, finish this process that we're working on for your short term, for sure. your short term problems. Right. All we have to do is think logically and, come up, and come up with a solution. Thank well, you, Preston. And I, and I agree with you. Preston, that's not we we were asked about why what we need and and as I said um, right now we're in the process of of evaluating what we need um, and I think that you jump ahead of the game when you start when you break it down and you go off into the weeds and you get distracted from the whole project when you start thinking about individual solutions to each one of those um, too soon so yes that could be an operational change that we could make. We can make a lot of operational changes, but what we need to do before we go forward with anything, unless it's a health or safety thing, is we need to evaluate, okay, if this operational change costs $70,000, 
and that operational change costs that amount of money, and this costs that amount of money, and this and this and this, at what point do we say that at this point, maybe we take the entire roof off and replace it rather than just patching the roof? So we're not there yet. We had a question about why, and we're trying to answer the questions of why. Yeah, um, my name is Pamela Wilder. Uh, I just heard today from, a, as they say, a reliable source <laughs> that, <laughs> that um, the state no longer requires fire stations to be built outside the tsunami zone. And that, to me, seems like it would make a huge difference in terms of where we would locate a station, because that has always been one of the concerns that we had to be outside the tsunami zone. Is that true? And does that make a difference in what you're thinking about building? Yes, yes, no, no. Um, <laughs> so to, the long answer is yes, they did. Um, they, they, years ago, the state decided that they would tell us where we could build. They didn't trust us to make good decisions, didn't trust the cities to make good decisions about where to build things. And then somewhere, they, they created that rule that you couldn't build in the tsunami zone. And then somebody at some point said, well, you know, I'm from an area where you just basically made it to where we can't build anywhere because everything is in an inundation zone. So what are we going to do now? So the, the state retracted that in 2021, they implemented a new rule because they weren't quite comfortable with giving us the responsibility for making all of the decisions on this. They, in, they implemented a new rule, House Bill 2605, if you wanna look it up, 2605 basically says you can build an, an essential structure or essential building, which fire, fire stations and police stations both fall in those categories. You can build those. However, we want some oversight on that. And what that oversight is going to be, nobody is quite sure yet. I think, is it, Kla how do you say it, Klatskanai? I, I always mispronounce it. Klatskanai um, needs a, I think it's a sewage treatment plant. They were unaware of House Bill 2605, and they went forward with their, with their plans to build and then they found out that the structural engineering, once they submitted it and, and in order to meet the state standards, was going to cost them an additional $6 million. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is, yes, we can build here. The state's not going to tell us we can't. The question that we don't know and I can't answer for you today, nobody can answer for you today, even the engineers that we've been trying to, to pick their brains um, cannot answer for you today how much more that's going to cost, what that's going to add on to the cost of our building. Will it be enough to offset any savings we have by making a smaller building? Maybe. We don't know. Yes. Um, we always seem to want to start with hello around here, and, and we never take the advice and experience with other people. There have been several new fire stations that these stations built. Banks is one we all drive by every day. They have taken these questions and they've taken the questions about zoning and and Susan Nami, they just taken all of this fire the fire and the banks. They've come up with a number that is percentage of what we were talking about. And it seems like we ought to go to them as experts at this point and look around and see what other people have done. And then learn from their experience and always starting out with a law. It just doesn't make good sense. Um, I think the idea of a substation is a very real idea. I think 20 years is a long time to plan on that. I think it will happen in the next 10, to be honest. Um, and so there has to be, we can't have the grandest thing that is going to get substations to see something. I agree. And so at that point, I think we want to use somebody else's idea. There is a training station at, uh, at banks, I think. <laughs> Uh, I think that there's there's things to explore that other people have explored already. We don't have to wait to be able to read that. You are you are correct. And again, that would come down to once we determine what we need here, what 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 the deficiencies are in this operation, what what this physical plant structure uh, is limiting it, where it's limiting us, then we look at operational changes, and that is part of that. You are correct. It should be this shouldn't be. You you never want to take one guy's idea. Um, this is how we should do it because what you, I'm saying is this: you think you need uh, this many lockers, you think you need all of this stuff. Um, it would be nice, but do other people have ways that they have done it that it doesn't take so much money? 
And that's the thing that I'm really interested in because here at Long, I'm glad we'll go down again. We know the city very well. We need to come across something that's working for people to pay. Well, and, and I think we we all agree on that. And that's one of the reasons why we're having in this town hall to start the talk so people can start communicating with each other and with the city because we we all pay our taxes. And what we want is something that is affordable and functionable for our our employees, the people that are going to save us someday, possibly. And with us. <laughs> but that's what we're working toward. And that's what this is all about, is just to get the conversation started. Did we answer your question? Come back to the first thing. I mean, it, and I, it, I, we couldn't give you an inclusive list today. We could go on and on and tie up this whole town hall meeting, but yeah. there, there will be more coming out as far as what we need. Thank you. I'm curious if you have a sketch of the process of how we get from here to a final building. This, to share with us a little bit about how you plan to work this through. Oh, I cannot tell you anything like that right now. <laughs> I honestly, I, I wanted to start the conversation. That's what this whole thing, and I have not given it any idea or any thought because I need to know and I'm not gonna waste any time on this if people don't want it. If people want it, then we will spend money and time going in that direction. And that's when we can set up a timeline, uh, a schedule of events, but I'm not wasting another six years of my life doing this. That's totally fair. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, hello, City Council residents and anybody that's here at this town call to me. Um, thank you for inviting us all. My name is Susan Pennington and I live at 1325 Sunrise Ridge Road. I spoke at a city, a city council meeting about a year ago to discuss the project of the Oregon Department of Transportation and the approval of sidewalks and crosswalks at the north end of Gearhart. The safety of people crossing the highway Highway to go to the west side of Gearhart is my utmost concern. I believe walking on Highway 101 for two miles to reach Pacific Way crosswalk is dangerous. The planning of a new firehouse is an ongoing issue and yet to be approved. This leads me to another concern regarding the new fire station. Will these two projects on the highway construction and the new firehouse occur at the same time? Because we all know about the increased traffic and the safety concerns every year between May and September. These months, more accidents have happened than any other time. So um, I would like if someone could, you know, answer my questions. Thank you. Well, you know, I have not heard from ODOT about when they are even thinking of starting this project on 101. Chad, have you had any contact with them? Uh, yeah, so Chaswick City with Gear Guide, uh, of course. Um, so the, the, the highway ODOT, we are on the radar because we have a transportation system plan and we have some ideas of what the new highway can look like if we were to make some changes, but there are no set plans. We have ideas, no plans. But the funding process for that happens every four years in ODOT. Now that we've had those ideas come out, we have our transportation systems plan, we're in that route, and then we're just waiting for available state money if it comes available. And when it does, then that project will kick off and it will involve the, the community. Sure. But, but um, there, there, is, there, is, there are drafts that have crosswalks crossing Highway 101 in the proposed plan. There are. Uh, You're absolutely uh, right. There's more than one or two. There's several of them. There are. But mm -hmm. ODOT is in charge of 101. The city can ask, and I've written a letter asking for one farther north on 101 to be included, a crosswalk up by um, yeah. line, what's the road that goes? Shamrock. Shamrock. Thank you. <laughs> but um, 
ODOT is in charge. ODOT's got the money, the purse springs, purse strings. So that's who's going to do that. Okay. A follow up? I just have a follow up, yes. Um, so a year ago when I attended this meeting, I have to probably go back to the minutes and, and, and rethink this, but these same words were discussed. And I um, read or heard at the same meeting or the following day that it was approved and the construction was going to start in four years. Maybe. I never heard that. Never heard that either. Well, I'd have to go back and read your city council meeting minutes to, to go back and, and that. And you guys are more than I do. Yeah, right. They're, they're still working on surveying and stuff because I've been in touch with your surveyors and they've been asking for information. So I still know they're in the planning stages mm -hmm. of it. Do you think these two projects might go on at the same time? If the people of Gerhardt want this fires, this emergency services building, I could see it being during the time when ODOT is working on 101. I can see that being a possibility. I do not know what their schedule is, though. I don't even know their cycle, where we are in their cycle of monies, if it's every four years. Thank you. You're welcome. In the uh, corner? Uh, speaking of issues with Mark, could you explain the um, how the, uh, the building and, and equipment to the mark is integrated into the services that the fire department can provide. Why don't you add anything? You're asking about, just to be clear, you're talking about the, the Reed Hurtig station, correct? Yeah. Can you yes. can you have something to add? Sure. Uh, so the Hurtig station is part of the Rural Fire Protection District. It's an entirely different taxing zone. And it goes from the end of Gearhart, which is what uh, just before East Pine Lane, mm -hmm. out towards the Gulf and Country Club, up onto Lewis and Clark Road, and even behind um, Gearhart a little bit on Lewis and Clark Road. They pay taxes to their district. Those taxes go towards that board. That board spends the money, and what they have done uh, through bonds and some other things is built the city a station, and the, that taxing district paid for that and is paying for that. They also provide the city with about one third of our fire budget to respond to their calls, which is about 50% of our calls. And we've been working on that contract that there's only so much they can provide, right? So they provide one third of our budget and we respond to the calls just like uh, we do with the city of Gearhart. We get called out to any area between the Astoria Golf and Country Club up to mile post six or seven up on Lewis and Clark Road, all the way through Gearhart and the beach. And some of those areas are rural fire protection districts, some of them. They have purchased one of the vehicles that are over there. The city of Gearhart has purchased the other vehicles, some through grants, some through um, uh, taxes. And uh, they provide us with a nice, nice building down there. We were just drilling down there last weekend, uh, doing some stuff. We do some practicing there. We have three vehicles in there, a very small meeting room and one bathroom. And uh, so that is that was built to help get us some more volunteers as well, to help cover that area, to bring their insurance down, which it did, and to get the volunteers from places like Colby Lake, which we pulled from some of our volunteers from. We have volunteers now that live in Colby Lake. They go to that station, and then we're responding both directions and kind of taking the call from both sides, one side or the other. That's how that works. The other that station, and that equipment, is, is that above the tsunami zone? Uh, it is outside some of the run-up zones. It's got a lower elevation. It's not quite as much inundation as it is here, but there is still a possibility for some inundation, I guess. And um, it was not built as critical infrastructure. It was built prior to the law changes with the, uh, uh, the building department, the Oregon State Building Department. So. You can't just build a fire station anymore. It's got to be quite the robust building to be able to take on the challenges that its environment um, lays out. So uh, it's an adequate building and it's good and we use it quite a bit. And something for something for you folks to, to think about when you were talking about the Rural Fire Protection District. Not only do they pay yearly taxes for their district, but they also pay forestry. So they're getting double planted. 
Okay, whether you have a tree on your property, if you live out in the plains, if you have a tree on your property, or you don't have a tree on your property, you're still paying into forestry. Right there. Well, we, uh, I certainly appreciate uh, Ms. Gould's knowledge and Chief Como and Chief Gregory, and most of the people that I've talked to don't dispute the need. The current concerns that will have been raised, I know you said you'd want to go backwards, is process. And the process of the last one seemed to lack transparency, seemed to be, you know, more of a tail wagging the dog. Like we've made this decision, now we're going to try and justify that. And I understand you have to balance out between the people who have the expertise and the other people. So I just want to say I appreciate uh, everyone being here the citizens and calling people up there. And I would like to see uh, the process be different, which I think would lead to much more of a successful outcome. And that is exactly why we're starting right here, right now with this town hall, because this is the way it's going to be done. We're going to bring you in for town halls and we're gonna discuss where we are on the project and where we're going if you decide this is what you want. And that's the conversation is what is it, it's all about today. Let's start the conversation and move forward from there. Because if you want a fire station, we'll work toward that. An emergency services building. <clears throat> anyway, so I, Thank you for saying that, but that is what we're doing. This is a totally new show, and it's going to be very transparent. I'm going to go here. Um, judging from what's transpired in the past, this process is going to take some time. That's right. And yet we're being told by uh, our faithful security people that they've got some issues that actually need to be fixed fairly soon. So can some of that be broken out and say there's temporary ways to make mm -hmm. their lives easier mm -hmm. while going through a multi-year process to look at a brand new facility? Because I can understand what they're saying mm -hmm. and everything they're talking about is very reasonable, I think. Um, I think that would be a good way to go about it. And I'd love to see that model come off the edge of the table too. It scares the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you, you mind if I bring up some here? I, I agree. And so it is a problem that should be fixed sooner. We, if you go into the police department, we have old wooden shelves that were built in there and they have doors and they're just bolted down. I'm hoping not to go in there. <laughs> <laughs> just to say hi. <laughs> uh, yeah. So one of the ideas is to tear that out of there, right? And we've, we've talked about this and to build something new that's more secure and more functional for what we deal with. Um, that in mind, we also know that there is an opportunity for a new building one day. So getting something that can come out of there and be placed right into the new, new building so that it's not, we're not, we're not buying it again. Right, that kind of my thought process is where we're at with it. So I, I appreciate what you're saying. I do agree. I'm going to go in the back. I came a little late, so I hope I didn't miss something. But I, for me, the elephant in the room is location. And in terms of last time, that was a big deal. Right. And everyone was extremely upset about having to accept and extend the urban growth boundary. Developer makes money, donates land. Well, since that time, now we have a much larger water issue. So is that still on the table? Is what's still on the table? To extend the boundary, let those homes be built, and a new station out of the Del Rey. It's not, I, we're not building out on Del Rey unless everyone, not everyone, the majority of people want it there, okay? If they want it here, then we'll build it here. The thing is, the urban growth boundary expansion 
is based on a different perspective, and that is our taxes. And the limit on our taxes, they only go up by 3% a year. We got inflation at 8% last year. We've got wage increases. We've got costs that go up, and we're not making a lot of money on uh, what is it? Um, vacation rentals, our room tax. Okay, it's going down slowly. Our income is not stagnant, yet it's not keeping up with what is really costing us to run this city. And so an expansion like that, possibly 40 houses, is a, a great way to keep us afloat and in the black. Okay, so... But, with the new station. No. Okay. No. I'd say people spoke pretty strongly about not having it there. And I, I kind of believe that's not going to be a choice if people choose to build again. And I believe most people, what I've heard is they'd like it downtown. And if it's downtown, I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I would like it to have a cedar facade, oh. <laughs> not just concrete. Okay. All right. Well, I just get the footnote. I heard a while back, is the tax revenue only like in the mid sixes? The what? In the, in the, mid, the tax revenue here is only like in the mid sixes. That's all the revenue the city brings in, right? Yeah, I think your your tax revenue that comes in and Justine, are you in here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, the incoming taxes for the operation of the city that come from your tax money is about seven hundred thousand. Okay. That's not a lot of money at all. Yeah. <laughs> You're paying one dollar and we have seven hundred thousand. That dollar is like what? I mean. Not a lot of right, it isn't. No. <laughs> We're we run lean and mean in this town. Any other questions? Oh, Eric. Thank you, Perry. My name is Eric Alfred. I live at 661 10th Street. So, with regard to the process, and uh, the process is just to try and determine if we as a community you know, want to go forward with this. That's the first part of the process. Does the council have just an idea, a ballpark of how much time you think you'd like to talk about this? How many of these sessions we might have? And how do we know determine whether we want to go forward? Is that by survey? Is that by show of hands in one of the meetings? You might not have decided these things yet, but can you give us a framework for how the company might be thinking of how we even get to that, that first degree? Oh, my goodness. Um, all right. I envisioned if people wanted to build a station that we would go through the process with a town hall meeting every month for the next 12 to 14 months. And in May of 2005, possibly go for a referendum on a bond. What did I say? 2005. 2025. But that is, um, again, fluid because I don't know how fast this is going to go. As far as finding out how we're going to do it, Chad, do we still have those voting machines? Yeah, uh, well, we, we have access to them. We have access to, there is a, um, I believe it's Scapoos so, yes. that have voting machines, instant read on what you want, yes, no. And we can do that at town halls, have one with an extended time period so people can vote on what the questions are. And that's the way I envision going forward. So we can move forward in a 
in a faster fashion than um, just having a town hall and people raising their hands. Yep. Harry, thank you. Uh, Kathy Zimmerman, thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for gathering today and uh, <clears throat> voicing your opinion and your ideas. And moving forward, I appreciate you having a town hall finally. Uh, we've needed one and we need more in the future. However, three o'clock is a difficult time for a lot of people. Is there any way we can have them have them move in the evening, early evening? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that wouldn't be a problem with me. I was looking at the fact that if I if I get my way and we have a town hall every month until we're set, I'm asking the staff to be away from their family during their time. And that is the big thing for me. It's, yes, we can move the time. And maybe it'd be every other meeting we could have in the evening. Sharon had a great idea, though. Um, Sharon, uh, I, or Sharon, that possibly we could stagger the, the staff time instead of coming in at the regular nine to five or whatever on the days that we have town hall. They could stagger maybe coming in eleven to seven or whatever. That would delete having any overtime, but still make it uh, uh, you know all gonna have to work together. And right. If you want participation in the city for mm -hmm. sure. And yes. if we have a, a roadblock of time that they aren't able to participate, you're not going to hear from everybody. So uh, I think I think Sharon's idea is a great idea. Talk to her about it. <laughs> I, I will talk to her about it since I. Uh, well, the other part of that idea was that we would have it at five o'clock so that our staff would just continue to be here instead of having to come back. Um, and that people who are working might possibly be able to make it at five o'clock. Anyway, and I don't know that if that's even feasible. I don't know what the logistics are. Obviously, the people who work here would know that much better than I would. So it was just a thought that I have. I don't know how workable that is. Is it thought? Um, thank you. <laughs> so let let me just. I want to take this back to the big picture again because Dana's really good with the details. In my mind, works a little bit more in big picture mode. So my question on the big picture is, Mark, can you please tell us what this building is made of and how earthquake stable it is? Uh, it's just brick, as far as I know. I don't even know if the brick was filled with concrete. No, it's not. Uh, not. My one concern that I've always had to deal with is the roof. Um, I think the roof's come off at least four times since I've been here. I've personally put blue tarps on it at least six times because it was leaking. <laughs> It's got one one inch drain up there that if you get one pine needle on it, it plugs up and floods this building, including our water shop. So which we're constantly dealing with and being up on this roof and 40 mile an hour winds with a blue tarp doesn't really work that well for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but and it's even fine. a flat roof in this climate in this area is just it's it doesn't work. So and, uh, but as far as the building, I, I don't. From what I was told, this building was built by volunteers. It wasn't even built by contractors. So I don't know if Preston might have a better answer that's to that. That's what this book says. If you read this book, I was reading it last night. It said it was built by volunteers, yes. and their budget was $20,000. So it was built by a bunch of firemen that had, I mean, they had, there were firemen here. And some of them were contractors, some were electricians, some were plumbers, and they all got together and built the building. Um, well, that's one way to save money. At one, point, well, at, one point, at one point, I was told the whole roof collapsed and they had to put these beams in after the fact to hold the roof in, especially the one that goes on the backside there. They brought in big equipment, took the part of the roof off and put that beam in afterwards. So, I mean, I personally patched holes in this brick for the last 25 years just, for, just so we could paint it so it looked okay. So... <laughs> How do y'all feel about sitting in there right now? Then? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. thank you. That was my next question. So yeah. if we had any no. size of an earthquake at this point in time, would we make it out of here alive? Okay, just asking. Well, that's how fast you can open those doors. <laughs> well, I only have to that's up to Andy. You. My concern on that is all the equipment in here. We have any kind of equipment. You lost all of your equipment to, to respond to anything. So that's a big deal. So that, that takes me to the big picture in my mind. I, I'm very, I, in my life, 
in my personal life, I prioritize trying to be prepared for things. Okay, if we're prepared for basically nothing with this firehouse. That's my opinion about this firehouse. This firehouse, to to uh, echo what Mark said, scares the living daylights out of me. It's it's disgraceful that we have a firehouse like this. And, and I'm sorry, that's just my personal feeling. I think there are people who are very much on the fence about, well, do we really need a new firehouse? And I, you know, you guys look around, <laughs> where's the storage area? There is no, they've got boxes on top of boxes. And I mean, this is just, it's just, it's awful. Okay, this is awful. There's, we need a space where we can train. We need a space where people can change their clothes, uh, decontaminate. Um, we need, a space where things can be put away so that if we do have an earthquake, think everything's not falling over. I mean, it's just, this is just common sense to me. So for those people who are still on the fence about do we really need a new firehouse, please come and really open your eyes. Look at this, walk around it, look at it. That's all I would ask. Thanks, Sharon. I'm gonna go to Bob now. Okay. Uh, my name is Bob Schwartz, and I live at Fort Point Street, Woodland Avenue, that's near Flats over there. Um, concerning the building, uh, I worked at as a mason and I examined some of this. And the reason that it's so poor is that they built it in 1958. The volunteer guy did a great job at But in 1958, there were different standard buildings. And when they laid the blocks, they, they use the mortar, and most likely they use beet sand. And the reason that it's crumbling is because, you know, you think of a beach, the rocks are tumbling. Well, if you take that sand and you mix it with the mortar, it doesn't bind like the mason sand should be. Mason sand has points on this, so it sticks. So not only do they probably use beet sand because there really wasn't standards then. So they might have used regular sand that they could get, but they probably used beach sand. And then the mixed cell, at that time, they probably didn't have regular two types of mortar with the right things of lime. They probably used a lot of lime. Anyway, you could kick this building over. Uh, I've worked on some, demolished them, and uh, you could literally kick it over and there's really no rebar, or there's probably different layers they didn't use the mesh. So yeah, it, it's in bad shape, and that's one of the reasons why. So, Thank you, Bob. Oh, Bob, did you just tell us that if we do have to demolish this building, our demolition costs are going to be less? <laughs> Thank you. Keep finding cost savings for us. What we need. Yeah. We'll have a big party. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Hi. My name is Tina Popke, and I just want to be clear, um, if I've heard correctly, is there a proposal on the table that this could be remodeled and a substation, and the police department have a, a separate building and a separate uh, whatever you need? But it, it, is, is there people that are actually... Is, is that on the table? Are we going to consider that? Are we going to consider making, you know, remodeling this, keeping the fire station in town and making it a substation? We are three minutes from CSAC. And, it, and everything evolves in this section. And I'm just wondering if that is a possibility. Okay, Tina, this building needs to come down. Right. Okay, it's a non-reinforced CMU building. Okay. And it's got a flat roof on it. Built in 58. It's it's gonna come down. We're gonna rebuild here. The, the, the question is, what size are we going to rebuild to? Okay. If our urban growth boundary went clear on out to the school district uh, line, which is north to the Grange, incorporate all of the east side of the highway, Colby Lake and everything else like that, everything on the west side, okay? If that was our urban growth boundary, well then we would need a larger facility. 
because you're servicing more area. Okay? But okay. as long as you're just servicing basically downtown Gearhart and, and the fingerlings off the off of the highway, you don't need you don't need a six or eight base station. Okay. Thank you. That's my opinion. <laughs> I'm going to go with this young woman now. Jennifer Deese, thank you for having the town hall. We are meeting it. Going off of yours, then, is there other property you are being considering? So, it'll be the new station. Can, or can that maybe would help in some of the deciding converting? We all know this needs to go down. And we all know that you guys need a bigger station and a police station. I have not explored any other property because this is an exploration into if people want. Well, that would help to decide if people yeah. want. Maybe if you give information mm -hmm. of, yeah. of other properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, Jess, read again. And that's a good question. How are we going to do volunteers in the future? A great question. All of these questions need to be answered. And I think that's what the mayor has imparted with me is that when we start this process, we're going to uh, go through a needs assessment. We're going to go through what other people have done. We're going to go through what it is that the city of Gearhart and its rural fire protection district needs. We're going to go through what our volunteers need. We're going to go through what our police department needs. And we're going to be transparent with that and open so you can all come up with it. The mayor's, and I, please don't let me put words in your mouth. It, his goal is to not come to you with a plan and say, hey, here, what do you think? It is to open this up to say, let's work on this together as a community and come up with something that will work for us. In, in the future. And we don't know what that future is, but there's a lot of ways that we can at least have that conversation, get it down on the paper and start taking care of some of those things. Because another big picture item here that you have is like, okay, for volunteers, we know that volunteerism in fire service has been very difficult for a lot of places. But you know what, little Gearheart just keeps on being scrappy. Currently, we've got 25 volunteers on our rosters, and we've got two more that are coming in 27. When I joined the fire department in 1996, with Preston, Preston Devereaux was already there, along with Mike, and uh, who else? We have Ron back there, and maybe a few others in here. We had about, oh, and, and Randy, we had about, what, 20 to 25 volunteers? We have 20 to 25 volunteers. The difference is, is back then, we were doing about 200 to 250 calls, and we thought we were busy. Last year, how many did we did, Chief? 744. 744 calls. Mm -hmm. Things are different. You also look at the amount of people that are in Gearhart, right? We have a 26% increase in the last census. That's a big change. When I started in 96, we had 900 people in the city of Gearhart. Now we've got 2,000 people in the city of Gearhart. And I think some of the other communities over that time have grown more. So there's a lot of calls. But the volunteers, they're doing a very good job of responding. We got a great group of people right now. I don't know how long that's gonna last. I remember in 1996, we were talking about, man, there's not as many loggers. There's not as many construction folk around Gearhart. What are we gonna do? Well, here we are 26 years later, and we still have 25 excellent volunteers that are putting their lives on the line uh, to do this. So cancer has been a big thing with us, you know, cancer and the way that it goes into firefighters, we kind of absorb it, right? Because we're in those messes. So a good solid fire station where people can clean up, where we can train, where we can maintain some volunteerism will also save this community potentially in the future, a lot of money. But all of those things have to be discussed with you Chad, and brought you up into that part, excuse part me as for well. interrupting. Yeah. Of those 700 and some calls, how many of those are medical calls versus fire calls, accidents, et cetera? And I would like to throw in if we do, if and when we do replace this fire station here at this location, which I would like to see, uh, what about um, medics? We're an older uh, 
group of people that live here, and you have a taller with a heart attack at any time. My, my biggest concern is, um, I think medics and transportation in the hospital. Yeah, and, uh, and plus, and, if my cat powers catch on fire, I'd like to get them put it out. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. I can I? But how many calls? Can I? Can I jump in with this? I I don't know that off the top of our head anybody came prepared to answer that question, but we'll we'll get that question answered as far as the breakdown of calls. Unless, do you know it off the top of your head? Uh, Chief does, I think. So uh, I will have my full end of report um, probably March just like I did, uh, 2023. You can go on our website and view um, the end of your report for 2022, which I did break down everything in detail. Historically, we run 48 to 52% medical calls. It's historically what we run. Uh, I just looked at the numbers last week, and I think it was uh, in 2023, we had 89 fires. Structure fires, wildland fires, car fires, just fires in total, 89 fires put together with that. Um, so if we look at 744 calls, we look at about half of that. Um, so 350, 360 calls was medical. Um, alone, then we have car crashes, we have structure fires, we have wildland fires, water rescues, we have search for lost people, um, whatever have you, everything else in between, hazardous stuff. Um, going in there, water rescues, I think I said that. Everything else is, is what we do. We're, here we're called as an all hazard response. So we don't just go to the house that's on fire. Like that's just one of the many things we do. We have a rope rescue team um, that can um, go down and bring people back up off of steep areas and, and steep cliffs. Um, we do have a means of, of doing uh, water rescues. With that, um, car crashes is, is a big thing. Um, we take care of lots of different avenues of stuff. And if you're looking at medics, medics is a third party transport company. They come with two people. Um, they will always call us because they can't handle or make a medical call with just those two people. Um, we're frequently needed uh, for even helping get somebody from their bed or in between their toilet and their shower or some position um, on the grid moved out. Um, now that's when, once they get to it. We've often been on a scene for two hours before medic even shows up. Um, and if you, uh, we heard a thing uh, last year, why don't we water rescue? We have Coast Guard. Well, if we come to Coast Guard, it's a recovery, not a rescue. They are at best 30 minutes out from the time that they get called. And that's if they're ready to go. So that's not an option. And if you just want to recover bodies, we can, we can set that up. So we do our best to cover as much as we can every time we get called out. I mean, you call 911 unless somebody's fighting. I mean, you're going to get him, and then we're going to come behind him anyway. So we, there's multiple things that we do to take care of the community with that. And about half is our medical calls. Can I also add to that? I'm so sorry. I want to add this. So I'm a paramedic. I'm going to be the first one at your house. You have three or four intermediates, AEMTs. We're exactly trained, and we have the exact same equipment as that ambulance, and we're coming to your house faster. Or even better, they don't have a Lucas. No, we have a Lucas, which increases your chance of survival from a cardiac arrest by 10 extra percent. In plain English, a Lucas is a is an apparatus that will PR perform PR. CPR on you. So, so thank you so you can you get out the doors. We can, <laughs> we yeah, yeah, yeah. get out the doors. We always get out the doors. We have never failed you thus far. <laughs> we we have a phenomenal set of volunteers that work hard to provide you these services, and they are so excited to be here, and they're all trained better and I will keep them we will keep them so much better than what you'll see on medics and I can promise you that so we just need to give them a little bit this is I've worked in a lot of fire departments I worked at four all at once this crew is amazing and we just need to foster them they love this community they're part of this community they're going to give you every ounce of what they have and they I mean they they go to paramedic school just to volunteer for free, guys. Do you know how much I paid for my paramedic school? Twenty thousand dollars. I paid less that for both of my bachelor's degrees. These are people who are paying for this. They love their community and they want to serve you. That's and I, like I say, and um, Donna, hold your thought for just a minute because I want to piggyback on this because I have ADHD and I'll forget what I wanted to say if I don't if I don't jump in here. I agree that. The current generations we're, we're bringing up now are not necessarily joiners. They're not necessarily volunteers the way that older generations are. And that is going to be a struggle for us maintaining a volunteer organization in the future. But let's not forget 
the value that these folks are bringing. And I think that what we need to do is some out of the box thinking, instead of throwing in the towel and saying, okay, we're, we're, let's just plan for not having volunteers in the future. I think what we need to think about are, are a couple of things. Number one, I looked up the budget for Seaside. Seaside has a different staffing model that as people ask constantly, why don't we just give it all to Seaside? Well, here's Seaside staffing model. What they set aside in their budget this year to pay their employees on the fire department, fire department $1.3 million. Do you know how much we pay our employees? About 180,000. Okay, so that is a significant cost savings. Now, that is the reason why I, and the fact that we do still have such great volunteers that keep showing up here. So you gotta look at, well, why do they show up here? And why would anybody volunteer? Why would anybody do that to themselves to come here, especially with some of the stuff that's gone on over the last couple of years? Why would they show up here? We can be, a, if we look at this as, we will be the place that if you're a volunteer, you want to come. People want to become volunteers because it's not that easy to get a job in the fire industry now. You may not know that, but it is very hard. I know it because I told all of my kids, do not become cops. Everybody hates cops. Everybody loves firemen. Go get firemen. <laughs> and I can tell you that jobs are hard to get. They're hard to get. So what a lot of these people do is they go and they show the initiative, they go through the training, they give themselves a step up, they come volunteer like in a place like this. So we may not, a lot of our volunteers, we have volunteers that God bless them show up and all they can really do now is drive a truck and they're showing up for us every day. They can't really, you know, muscle around things, but they're still showing up for us every day. But you have the new younger ones that can do the physical activities the problem is they don't stay around for very long. They come and they go, they come and they go, but they're here to be trained so that they can they see the value in coming and training for us. So what we have to do is set ourselves up as the training ground, the place where if you're a volunteer, we're going to have the equipment that you want to practice on. We're going to have a modern industry here or a modern operation here that you say, I volunteered for Gearheart, and people say, I want to hire you. That's how we maintain or put off the inevitable of having to go to a model like Seaside where we're having to pay a lot of money for our fire department. So let's not throw the towel in on it. I absolutely refuse to throw in the towel on our volunteer organization. They are great people and they're gonna to continue to show up for us. But like she said, we need to understand what motivates them and continue to give them the things that motivate them to come here. And Sorry. With, and one more thing, with that, that has happened here. Two of the chiefs in Seaside work here are volunteer fire members. Yeah. <laughs> Donna. Uh, uh, Deanna. I'm sorry, Deanna. I'm sorry. Um, I'd just like to say that I've always felt that the fire station should be rebuilt down here in the heart of Gerhart. Um, some people may be concerned about the earthquake and the tidal wave. Um, I used to work for a land surveyor and did a you know a little bit of engineering, you know, with you know putting pilings down on uh, motels down in Cannon Beach because the, the buildings are so heavy, they're built on top of a marsh. And so we put pilings down. And so if you design the fire station to withstand um, the most moderate earthquake, um, I, I think we should plan to do you know, you know, the good engineering. Um, and, and, and it should be here. And, and I do think that it should be like a station tied in with, with Seaside and maybe not make such a fancy building down here like what had originally been proposed. But uh, that, those are kind of my thoughts, but we were, you guys were talking about, uh, you know, the Gerhardt Fire Department and working with medics. And a week and a half ago, we had to call 911. And my, my husband was very close to death. And, you know, the response time with the fire department and medics was five minutes. So, you know, most of the people that live here are within this perimeter. So we can't put a fire station out there on Delray Beach Road. We've got to keep it here. So 
that's that's what you guys got to keep in mind. But, but yeah, I do want to make this fire station as earthquake proof as possible. I know this building is is toast, and you know um, we we've got to you know ex expedite this as quickly as possible. Not have several years of committee meetings to try to get the fire station built. So that's that's all I got to say. Thank you. Can I say something? All right. I know that I know that the chief the chief Cole over here and the assistant they don't want to toot their horn or anything like that. But every single person that's a volunteer fireman in this station and seaside. Okay, have to have the exact same training as Portland Fire Bureau, Portland Fire Fire and Rescue, Seattle Fire Department, every paid department. The problem is that 80% of all firemen in the United States are volunteers. And the fire marshal seems to think he's got his ear listening to the, the, the unions and the paid people. When I was chief, I fought tooth and nail with him about gear your training towards the volunteers. Because if a paid if a paid guy at Astoria wants to go and take a class, chief just brings in just brings in somebody that's off and pays him, pays the guy to go to school. So every single one of the volunteers, you know, are your volunteers. Thank you, Preston. I'm going to get um, one more question, maybe two. Thank you all for being here. I realize many of the council members are volunteers. Many of the people here are volunteering their time. I'm with Eric. I appreciate that you're going to go about this with a certain method in mind, but you keep saying, Carrie, if this is what you want, I think there's an outcry right here in this room. Let's get the ball rolling. I think yeah. it is commonly agreed that the fire station needs to be rebuilt. <coughs> Somehow the money has to be found for the police uh, area needs attention. Uh, let's get the ball rolling. I, I wonder if we need 16 months of town halls or if you have the momentum now to keep moving. The 16 or 16, 14 months of town halls are to keep you informed step by step of what we're doing. So there's no, we're doing things behind your back, under the table, in closed doors. I want this to be as transparent as glass. All for them. And that is why it's going to take a while. I, I believe everyone. Most everyone knows we need a new station. And I hope to come back next month with the town hall where we can actually decide, is this where we're going to start? And then we start here, are people going to understand it's going to cost money? We're going to have to get an expert because I don't want to run this show. I don't have the expertise. Nobody, I believe, on the council or in city employment has the expertise. So I want to be able to go out and say, let's get an expert, let's get them on the team, and let's start making things happen and show the people every month, this is where we are, this is what we're doing, and this is what it's costing, because it's going to cost. Would it, would it be possible to publish a summary of this meeting in the city blog each month so that we don't keep 
Going over the same oh, we're not going to go over the same ground because I cannot do that. <laughs> um, as far as this will be on the blog or whatever they post this to, okay. you know, YouTube or whatever, but it, you go to the blog and then you go to you. However, they've got it set up. I don't do that because I'm here. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm going to go with Eric one more time. And... Then it'll be the last question. I'll go to you. Thank I don't. You, I just want to kind of agree with Cam. We don't, you know, we can decide, I think, very soon if we want to go forward with the proposal. And so I encourage you to offer that to us. Right. But before we're done today, I'd even like you to ask, I mean, based on what we've heard today, uh, I'd like you to ask us for a straw poll today by a show of hands. How many people here today think we want to go forward? With a new building. So I'd like to ask you to do that before well, we leave some. But then, <laughs> additionally, I'd like to also ask that we that this should be a front burner issue for our community. We should expedite this. In my opinion, looking around based on what people have said today, it's urgent. This this thing could we don't want to meet here again. And everybody was concerned about the cost. But the longer we wait, the more it will cost. And yeah. That's true. From whatever we would have spent from the last bond, we would get less today for spending that same amount of money. And that would be true two and four and six years from now. So we have to report. I'd also like to offer the idea that if we decide we want to go for it, and then the question is where to put it, what kind of building is it, how much are we going to spend? We all have a variety of attitudes. And because a lot of people have been speaking to that idea, they'd like to see it here. I would like to just say not everybody in the community feels that way. I don't feel that way. I feel it's important to move it outside the tsunami implementation zone. I think that's my best step. So since nobody advocated for that today, I just want to make sure the council knows some people in the community feel that. And when we get to the point of how to decide what to build where, I'd like to suggest that you could offer us, we get to the point where engineers give us ideas. It could be here, be here, be here, be this big, this big, this big, uh, this big. Give us three, perhaps four proposals. And as a community, we vote in ranked choice manner. So that one option wins by getting the majority. And if out of those four options, nothing gets more than 50% than the idea that was lack. Everybody gets to rank their priorities. Sure. And this builds up to what the community really wants. If no, no option gets 50% on the first one, then the option that got the least votes, all of those second place votes get added in until we get to something that gets to. I'll be in touch with you, Eric, so you can <laughs> tell me. <laughs> well, it is. It's just that that can happen. Yeah. Okay. But this is an idea that that'd be a nice option to consider how we decide. Right. <laughs> it is. I'm going to go one more question. Thank you. Ray Stoddard, Garden Terrace. Um, Knowing that the process is going to take years before anything's finalized, even even building started, is there any options in the near future? I, I've been a firefighter. I, I fire was a volunteer firefighter for eighteen years. I was on a paid department for twenty years. I spent twenty years in the military. Um, that doesn't really add up, but I double I double punch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there the option of bringing in annexes? Or using some shipping containers. Because you can put a shipping container out here, run some heat and electricity to it, put that air compressor out there in the damn shipping container, free up some room. You could probably do that with some of your storage with hoses that are already dry and waiting to be used. I mean, you can move some things around with some temporary storage for these things. Um, I don't know if the law enforcement can put evidence in a locked shipping container next to a building. Or if they have to put it up next to a building or on the way into the building itself. But I mean, there are options in the short term that will help out in the long term. Because you know, there's not nobody's even going to break ground on anything here for, for a minimum of two years. Yeah. So, I mean... There are options out there for some temporary stuff. Yeah, I think to, to do the safety stuff, that's something we've been looking at. But we have been doing a lot of those options over the last 
quite a few years. You'll see the shipping container that's out there now. Yes, I know you guys. And but some you things, put some electricity out there and put that thing out there. Safety, well, the safety is you gotta, one. Can I tie into Duncan this old electrical gun. grid, which yeah, is, this oh, is yeah. an old building. Okay. Thanks. So. I will yeah, say, it, too, that, that Connex that's outside um, has okay. some records from back in the day, and I've, and I've only been here seven months, and I've already had a call from a lady who had a missing person case in, in your heart in 1986, I believe. Um, I sent Sergeant Brown to take care of it and look for the records, right? Because he's been here for 13 years. Um, and it took him a while. He did find a an index card that had the person's name on it. The rest of it was destroyed in a flood. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of thing we have to worry about when we put Absolutely. items like that out. No, I mean, you got to be picky about what you put in a, yeah. a storage can. It can't sit there. can be made watertight. Then we. Right. Put the heat in there or moisture absorbing stuff or whatever. What, seven months? You haven't got everything scanned in yet? Yeah. <laughs> right. We'll get right on that. <laughs> Mayor, if I can add real quick, I think there's people online. Just see what's saying. There's, there's people online. Okay. Um, Christy, what do we have? Well, no one has their hand raised, but maybe if someone would like to speak, they could. Raise their hand. <laughs> oh, we got one. Pat Patricia Roberts. <laughs> okay, um, Pat, are you going to speak? <laughs> yeah, I think you're muted, Pat. There, there, I got it. Okay. Um, my one question or my one point is: it appears to me that a great deal of the physical site that is the fire department. Um, is taken up by a, a city shop. Is that correct? Okay. Currently. Right. Currently, yeah. So I'm also suggesting that there be an appraisal of the land that you have. Also, there's a lot of land behind to the north of City Hall. I mean, <clears> is <throat> there a more, is there is there a denser way to use what you have, the actual physical site you have? That's my only question. Great minds think alike. Yeah, I, I think that's some of the studies that we need to do. You know, we need to take a top-down approach on what kind of property we have and where where you want to put it, and then really figure out whether or not we can do it. That's that's going to be part of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so there are four four phases to my mind in my experience in in projects when you're developing a project. We are right now. I mean. We tried this before, the bomb <laughs> failed. So we're essentially back in phase one again. Phase one is building understanding, building support. And that's what we've done today. It sounds like we have a lot of support now. People understand, we, we're here to answer questions. These aren't even all of, we haven't even given you a comprehensive list. I, I told you we're working on a needs analysis that's gonna tell you exactly what we need. Part of that needs analysis is going to include what is it that we're gonna need on the first floor? Because we can always build up but you only have so much real estate here to work on. And it's gonna be an interesting trick to fit all of that into this, considering that we are then also going to, cons to um, affect public works. And we also not only have a fire station, but we have a police station that needs more room. So a lot of people are asking us a lot of questions and, and giving us opinions that are great opinions, but they're a little bit, you're a little bit ahead of the game. So we are going to get to the design and we are going to get to the where's and the wins, but we are still in the understanding stage right now. We need to make sure everybody understands because I guarantee you when we get to the design stage and the where's it gonna be and how big is it gonna be and what's it gonna cost, that's when we're all gonna have our arguments. We're gonna start taking each other off of everybody's Christmas card list. We're gonna put on our gloves and we're gonna go at it. And that's fine as long as we have the foundation where everybody says, okay, we're disagreeing, but we've gotta to come to some kind of agreement because remember, we've already agreed this has to happen. It's in our best interest. It's going to save us money in the long run if we don't delay this. And if we don't say, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm just going to be an absolute no. If it's not my way, I'm going to be an absolute no. So let's, today was the, the point of today was not to get to the design, not to get to the where. It was to get to an understanding of this has to happen. 
And then we are going to analyze the problem. We're going to give you the information and we're going to ask you for, for then to make an informed decision. We need this much square footage on the first floor. You can't put your fire trucks on the second floor. We can put offices on the second floor, but how much square footage do we need on the first floor? And then we know, can it fit here? Which I think it probably can, but I don't know for sure. Or does it have to go someplace else? So let's let's work in building blocks. Let's not get ahead of ourselves and start arguing yet about where it's going to be. Let's start with an agreement that it's going to be. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. And then we'll, we'll work out the details. We'll hash that all out later, hopefully as nicely as possible. OK, is it going to be long, Tim? Sure. Good. Sure. Um, one, thank you for the demeanor and the tone and the welcoming embrace of this meeting with your citizens. I will just, I'm not going to talk about the past, but thank you. Keep this up. There's a lot of people that aren't here today and want to be or are blind. So including the whole population of your heart should feel this energy. We're your partners. You're our partners. Collaboration, negotiation about all these details ahead is what the more we can feel together on this and that we've had our, our say and our communication with each other, the better. So we will all love this place. We already do. We'll love it more with a safe and secure, excellent building in the future. So thank you. Keep this up at all meetings. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Is it short? Okay. Uh, that this is the last question. There are a couple other things that I wanted to do at this. Town Hall. Go ahead. Part of the needs assessment that we're doing right now, hasn't that been done in the past that you can compile that information? No. <laughs> yes and no. Some of it. It should have been. Yeah. I think some too. There's a, there's so that one, that was short, the 14, 16 month time frame. I think the majority has been covered on at the meetings in the last two years or more. Mm -hmm. The majority of the people that are in the community agree that we need to have a new facility. And uh, it is a huge thing, a huge undertaking, as you said. And somebody else said the elephant in the room. The answer is how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. The hang up is bad. It's where you're going to put it. You're going to put it way out here. You're going to get land. You got all these other things. You need to break it down and start taking it a step at a step at a step. Accomplish one thing. Two, three years we've been at this, we have nothing. Oh, no. It's no. been six years. But good point. And that's what this is the first step. Roger that. Okay. Now, Dana, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Um, no, not on that. Okay, not on. Not on that. Not okay. Rita. Yes, I do have something to say. I've been quiet because I'm sitting with a panel of experts. There's police experts, there's fire, there's all of your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and we have former police chiefs, we have all this, and I am an expert in nothing. So I have didn't really want to say anything. Oh, we've had experts in public works too. Thank you, Mark. Um, but I am so encouraged by what I've heard from the audience because you guys have really done your homework and you're not just here to say, oh, thumbs down or thumbs up. You really know what you want. So I'm very encouraged by all of that. And although I'm an expert in nothing, thank you for coming. <laughs> um, and um, her... Eric's suggestion on a straw poll, if you raise your hand, if you want a new fire station. Okay, a straw poll. I think it's pretty obvious that most people here want a new fire station. Okay. Next month when I... Uh, I will have a suggestion at least one or two suggestions, and we can talk, and maybe we can even have the <coughs> voting buttons working. And that way we can all see if this meets with your approval or not. But the other items that I wanted to talk about, 
the city has the uh, is it the right to first refusal an opportunity an opportunity there's a property adjacent to ours that p pacific power used to have a transformer it's deq cleared no contaminants just at the end of this open space it's not a full size lot but it is property the city could use. We could move our green waste and our recycling out there because if we do build here, that area back there is gonna be closed off. And I'd like to see the green waste and the recycling continue. Yo, Dad. Hey. <laughs> hey, Dad. And so there's that to think about and talk about with your neighbors, whatever, it's gonna cost some money, but I think it's a great investment for the city. The other thing I wanna ask, does anyone feel like the city should approach Bob Mori about the school property? For, for what? Acquisition by the city. For what? For what? For what? For what? Are you gonna do with it? We can move City Hall down there. You had an opportunity. Yeah. The what? You had an opportunity. No, we didn't. We could not come up with a referendum and get it on the voting on the. You, you, you blew it with that. You no. had an opportunity. Bob bought an I just want to know if there's any kind of consensus that we should even ask. Yes. No. Okay. Yes. 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 We'll come back to that. Okay. <laughs> Sell this property. No. Sell this property. Now, are we talking women in the domain or are we talking? I mean, because if you want to go from that, let's take a chunk of the golf course. No. 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 I mean, hey, you know, that, all I did was ask a question. I'm not trying to start a fight. Okay. Okay. Can I say something about that? Uh, may I say something about that? Sure. Why not? That would give, give us all kinds of offices, facilities. People no. have a community center. Why not? Okay. Okay. Well, we've had our straw poll. We've had our meeting. We've had our discussion and our questions. Thank you very much for coming. What? Here at City Hall. What's that? Yeah. Right, and that's what I just said. Next meeting, I'll I'll try to come up. People. Whiteboard. Whiteboard.